First technical hitch of the morning, I was muted. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to Empowerment and Partnership in Student Engagement. My name is Oshin Hassan. I'm the Programme Manager of NSTEP, the National Student Engagement Programme, and we're delighted to be hosting this conference alongside Quality and Qualifications Ireland and studentsurvey.ie. Um, I'm just on here to give you a very brief welcome and say please do interact with us during the day. Uh, use the Q&A function throughout the day to ask our panellists and speakers any questions that you may have. Uh, and uh, I'll now hand over to my colleague in studentsurvey.ie to tell you a wee bit more about the rest of the day. Thanks Siobhan. Good morning everybody and thank you so much for being with us. My name is Dr Siobhan McLanica and I'm project manager of studentsurvey.ie that is the Irish Survey of Student Engagement and the Irish Survey of Student Engagement for postgraduate research students. We are so thrilled to have you here today and we hope you're excited about this day as we are. Um, just a couple of things to mention before I hand over to our chairs who will then run the rest of the session. Please, as Oshin said, do engage with us either through the Q&A in this live session or else also uh, converse with us through Twitter. Our handle is um, you can uh, tweet us at QQI underscore connect at nstepie or student survey ie, but also using the hashtag uh, hashtag student engagement 2020. And just to give you a little bit of encouragement in that way, and as a, our way of saying thank you for attending this event, we will be sending a gift pack out to some prize winners of those of you who engage with us through the Twitter. That pack will include our lovely branded mug. I feel this is very show and tell. Um, a lovely piece of Skellig's chocolate for the coffee drinkers, some lovely ground coffee from Cloud Picker, and those of you who prefer your cup of tea, we'll send you out a few tea bags as well. So you can have a cup of tea and a bit of chocolate on us. So um, please do engage. And just very, very briefly in relation to studentsurvey.ie, hopefully those of you who have access to your campus have received a copy of the report. Um, oh, there you go. Um, but for those of you who've not been able to access campus to get your hard copies, the report is currently available for download from studentsurvey.ie forward slash reports. So that's everything for me for now. I'll hand you over to our chairs to begin the session. Thanks and I'll hand you over to John. Thank you so much Siobhan. Um, can I say um, I have a little house in Balance Skellig, which is very close to Skellig Chocolate Factory. Um, so those of you who really like chocolate, that's the place to be. And I can't believe Siobhan, did you put it up in front of me because it seems a long time since I've seen that blue wrapper. Um, so good morning, colleagues. And it's just, first of all, Siobhan and colleagues, thank you so much for me the opportunity to join you this morning. This is a really important event. It's one that I'm really enthusiastically as support. Um, the students are at the centre of what we do in all our institutions. To hearing that student voice with the student survey enables us to do is critical to that. And I'm really pleased that Siobhan and your leadership and the team in supporting us here today, but more generally across the organisation is to enable us to hear the student voice in, a, in an orderly way, but also I suppose to give us the responsibility, all of us as leaders in institutions, to listen to that voice and to act on that voice. And it would be wrong for me to say that it's easy. It's not easy. It's it's easy maybe to hear, but to listen is something is is, is a bit trickier. And and what I mean by that is we we hear um, lots of really good data and really good information, but sometimes we're pretty slow to to act on that. And I and I would say that's a piece of work that we as organisations, and I can only speak for UCC here this morning, but I think more generally, if I'm honest, I think that we as a, as a sector need to see how we can close that famous loop. Uh, I wish somebody could find that loop first of all and then maybe close it. But but I think for me at least, um, I think the important point is that today is about listening. For me listening, it's about hearing the voices, but also putting an action plan in place to see how we can implement the really important steps that our student voices bring before us. So I'm really excited to hear um, what we're going to, from our speakers, but also to welcome you here today. And Kevin and I are, Kevin is the co-pilot or the pilot. Kevin is the pilot, I'm the co-pilot. So Kevin, um, you might guide us through all of this, but it's a privilege for me. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm really excited to hear the voices today. Thank you so much, Siobhan. I'll hand over to Kevin now, thank you. Thank you, John. Um, John made reference there to us being the pilot and the co-pilot and hopefully we're able to safely navigate through the journey today and get a safe landing, hopefully no emergency landings. Um, 2020 has been quite a year of change for higher education in Ireland and, and worldwide, I think it's fair to say. Um, it's probably too early in the morning to use that dreaded word that begins with C that's been on the tip of our tongue for the last eight months, um, but there has been another major change here in Ireland when it comes to higher education, and that has been the establishment of the first standalone department, 
for further and higher education. Welcoming you all to today's event is the minister who took the helm of that department back in June 2020, Minister Simon Horace. Unfortunately, the minister couldn't be with us this morning, but he has taken the time to send through a video to welcome you all. So I'm now going to hand over to um, Minister Horace to give um, an opening address to today's event. delighted to have been invited to formally open uh, this forum on empowerment and partnership in student education. I cannot think of a more important time to be talking about student empowerment. We've come through a really, really tough and difficult year, a tough and difficult year for everyone in this country, for everyone across this globe. We're a particularly tough year for our students and you have shown incredible resilience. COVID-19 has taken so many legitimate expectations and hopes that you would have for life and it has turned them upside down and in many ways it has temporarily taken them away. But I want you to know this. I want you to know that there will be life post-COVID. I want you to know that we will get through this. I want you to know that I genuinely and passionately believe 2021 will be a year in which we make great progress and move to a much higher ground. There's so many hopeful signs out there in relation to vaccines and vaccinations. So thank you for your forbearance. Thank you for putting up with what has been a really difficult, tough and challenging year. I'm proud of young people in this country. In many ways, they have led the way throughout this pandemic. They have worked on the front line and they have shown leadership in their communities. They have helped those in need. I want you to know this. My new department of further and higher education is not a department that belongs to somebody else. It belongs to you, the students, the students of Ireland. It is for you we have this department to make sure we can apply a focus to the issues that matter to you. And I know there'll be moments we'll have disagreements. I know there'll be moments where we can't get everything done as quickly as we would all like to. But I genuinely believe working together we can make real improvements. And we've already started. We're reviewing the SUSE support grant, the student support grant system, to make sure it's fit for purpose because it's currently not. We're putting in place structures in the department so we can hear your voice. We're developing a new literacy and numeracy strategy to make sure no one gets left behind. We're setting up technological universities across our country to make sure you can access higher education no matter where you live in our country. We've doubled the student assistance fund. We've provided a fund to buy laptops so you don't just say to students we're moving things online without actually providing them with the supports. So five months in, we're already trying to get things done together. But we have so much more to do. And I really, really look forward to working with you, the students of Ireland, but working with all our education partners to make sure we build the further and higher education system that we want, to make sure that we get the message out there that there is a pathway for you, no matter who you are, whether you're male or female, where you live, where you come from, or what your mum or dad did to get to where you want to get to in life. We're only beginning the journey, and I'm really excited about this, but I've no doubt that after COVID-19, we will emerge stronger. We will have learned things from this pandemic, things about how to support each other and look after each other, but also about how we can use online to help, but also about the importance of human contact and human interaction. So we'll have many difficult and challenging days ahead, but we're going to get through them and we're going to have a very strong from them. I hope you have a great conference and I really do look forward to where we can all meet in person again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister, Thank you very for, much, Minister for your kind words. We look forward to working with the Minister to place the all sorts of all center of decision making in our and at the center of the new department. Center of the new department. At the core of today's event, the it's strong commitment event, to embodying the principles of student party principles of student every party. As the national representative body, the have been delighted to work alongside to work student survey and KSI in the development of this event. The development of this event. With the spirit of partnership, the spirit of partnership um, as for many, as it's very fitting that the first speaker that is Lorna Fitzpatrick is Lorna Fitzpatrick. Lorna Fitzpatrick, Lorna Fitzpatrick graduated from Business and Human Resource Management in and Institute of Study in Chicago. Lorna got involved in class rep, part time PE president for education and welfare, and president of the Carlo Students Union. Lorna left Carlo Students Union in the team to take up the role of the society. Encompassing Trilly, Encompassing Limerick, Limerick, Cork, Waterford, and of course, Lorna is currently serving her second term as the first second term as the president of Northern Ireland. 
The first person in nearly a decade to serve two terms as the President of USA, learning with 374,000 students across the island. Across the island, working with students, working with student students, students, officers, students, and a research officers, stakeholders, and a research and stakeholders, stakeholders, and protect, and protect students, and protect students, and protect students, their lives. Learn it all to their lives. Learn it all to the boss. We're saying, leave it to the boss. We're saying, everything I might get in trouble for, and, and I hand over to your first, and I hand over to your first. Lorna Fitzpatrick. Lorna Fitzpatrick. Thanks a million, Kevin. Thanks a million, Kevin. I hope you can only hear me once, but I'm not entirely once, but I'm not entirely. I can hear a bit of feedback from myself. Feedback from myself. The joys of online. The joys of online. We're all trying to to work. We're all trying to to work with you. I might try to mute and come back. I try to mute and come back and. I wonder, are we in a better position? I wonder, are we in a better position? Then? <laughs> <laughs> you don't believe so. You don't believe so. This is a joke. So. This this is a joke. joke. Over the yeah, over the ID. I'm sorry for saying the C I'm words. Sorry for saying the C words. So not to, to, get it in there. to get it in there. To get it in there. We're trying to work out some technical. We're trying to work out some technical. Apologies for the delay here. For the delay here. Okay, I think we're going to try again. Oh, I don't hear myself back, so I think that's a, a good start. Um, brilliant, I'm seeing some smiling faces now, which is much better. So I think we're, we're good to go. So apologies for that. Slight technical hiccup. Um, I suppose that's the, the joys of it all at the moment. I think we're all um, coming to terms with the, the technology that we're using um, and trying to learn more about it each and every day. Um, but First of all, um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today to welcome and open um, the Empowerment and Partnership in Student Engagement Conference. I'm thrilled to have been asked to, to welcome and to open um, this conference here today. As Kevin said, um, although with quite an echo, my name is Lorna Fitzpatrick. I am the president of the Union of Students in Ireland. Um, and I'm sure it comes as absolutely no surprise to you that student engagement is something that we care a lot about in the Union of Students in Ireland. It's brilliant to see such a great schedule for today. And honestly, it reassures me that we are making great progress in supporting and developing meaningful student engagement across all levels of our sector. When I was asked to speak at this event, I spent some time thinking about the principles of today, empowerment and partnership. And it made me look back on my own time and, and my own journey in the student movement and how I've gotten to the position to be able to speak to you today. Full disclosure, I have been involved in the student movement for quite a few years now and um, from my role as a class rep right through to being a part time and full time officer in IT Carlo Students Union before going on to be elected to USI. So I think it's safe to say I've probably ran more elections than many politicians in Dáil Éireann, but the less we say about that, the absolute better. I think um, about the definition of empowerment for today. I looked up what it meant before uh, putting these words together and what came through was the process of becoming stronger and more confident. Well, in my case, that most definitely was true, although my secondary school teachers will probably tell you that I was very quick to speak up. But if we look at that definition and think about it through the prism of student engagement, and particularly in, in my experience, it was the people around me 
supporting me, providing me with the resources to recognize the skills I had, while also providing me with the space to develop them further. I think that's critical in the wider theme for today, and it is the foundation for empowerment. Students know they have a voice. They know they have something they want to say, but sometimes they don't know where or how to say it in a way that can lead to a better outcome. And let's be honest, there's study after study telling us about the importance of diversity in decision making within the workplace. Today, we've seen an Irish Times article with Dr May speaking about the significance in becoming the first female president of a university and how much more needs to be done to ensure gender equality. So we know the same importance of diversity to be true of decision making within education. So it would be hard to think that meaningful student engagement in the decision making within their colleges would not lead to better decisions. Thankfully, we have traveled this road quite a bit. And I think there is broad recognition for the importance of ensuring the student voice is at the table. But at times, I think we may still have better to do to ensure that it is in a meaningful way. One way to ensure that that is the case is through empowering students, providing them with the space to access training, to support them to engage, to develop their skills further so that they can be involved in a meaningful way, while ensuring the structures and the culture is one of inclusivity and support. Students are active citizens, both in democracy and in our college communities. We don't need to create them. We just need to create and further build the platforms for them. We must also recognize the diversity in our campuses and ensure that our brilliant diversity is reflected in all areas of our structures for partnership. And again, much of this will come back to the central themes of today, empowerment, partnership, but also the broader culture in which they are couched. We need to recognize that the student representation has increased. We are doing better than before. There is, in most cases, recognition of the importance of student voice. But now we need to focus on moving past that and building further. I think we have to recognize how far we have come from solely meeting the legal requirements, but let's not re rest on our laurels. We need to continue to champion those developments. Students want to be partners in their learning and in the development of their institution. We want to have seats at the table, the table that does the work alongside the table that makes the decision. Students have a vital role to play in the sense of community, something that I think we all miss at the moment. The evidence is clear. Much of the research you will hear today, it will underpin the need to keep progressing. Today is a great example of partnership in action. In all panels and sessions, there are staff and student voices on the same platform. There is an emphasis on the process for engaging students in a meaningful way, which is very much welcomed. As a national student representative, I strongly believe we need to lead by example to support the capacity building and cultural change within all levels of our institutions. From a course level to a faculty and school level, right through to the overall institution. We will also have the opportunity to look at some of the work that has been undertaken over the past few years to enhance student engagement. The organisers, studentsurvey.ie, NSTEP and QQI have played vital roles in the enhancement and development of partnered learning communities. Studentsurvey.ie provides a space for students to express their views on their engagement within their learning community. The results of the surveys have shown the amazing work that has been done by the students, the staff and the leadership within institutions to ensure engagement throughout. However, there's always room for improvement and studentsurvey.ie provides each, each institution with the opportunity to recognise those areas and encourages the institution to work with their campus communities, particularly staff and students, in a partnered approach to enhance these further. And I look forward to hearing some about those developments later today. And step aims to strengthen student engagement and decision making across higher education with staff and students um, to embed the principles of students and co-creators and partners within their institutions. The student training programme, which is fully online this year and exceeding all targets, is a testament to the focus being placed upon empowering students. I think back to attending class rep training before NSTEP, and I really can't explain how much of a difference it has made to student engagement and to the overall student experience. Today we'll hear about the drivers, the enablers and the principles that underpin the work of NSTEP, all of which will be exciting developments for student partnership. QQI continues to champion the enhancement and importance 
of embedding student voice within the quality enhancement structures of our institutions. The National Agency for Quality placing such an importance on the student voice has in no small way really helped to progress the national picture for student engagement. Many advancements in meaningful student engagement are in no small way down to the work of the organisations leading and supporting today. However, it must be said that much of the development is down to the college communities taking steps to improve the culture, to engage with students as partners and to recognise the challenges as they are presented while working together to find and embed solutions. And so back to that dreaded C word that I did try to avoid for most of this. Um, we all know the challenges that COVID-19 has posed in our daily lives. Students and staff alike have been forced to change many of their practices basically overnight. And I wish to thank and commend the staff who have done all in their power to support student learning during this time. We have the National Teaching and Learning Report launched by QQI earlier this year, which shows how much work was undertaken by the sector in such a short period of time to ensure high quality teaching and learning continues while this pandemic continues to impact our daily lives. Students have been very vocal about the challenges that they have and continue to face with their colleges, with their local students unions and with us. And we continue to further vocalise their experiences and work with other key stakeholders to help find solutions. Once again, trying to lead by example through showcasing students as co-creators and as partners. Ensuring students are central to discussions and decisions during and post COVID-19 must be a priority for us all. Students, as the largest stakeholders in many colleges, have a unique experience and valuable perspective to bring to the table when discussing these issues. It would be a shame if they were not to be engaged. I know we are all under immense pressure to get things over the line, and sometimes meaningful engagement may be viewed as a delay to the process. But I can assure you, the students I have had the pleasure of working with over the past few months would add new perspectives that may open entirely new avenues that would achieve better outcomes. It comes back to the principle and underlying understanding of diversity and different voices leading to better solutions. The current situation will continue for some time, although hopefully not for years ahead, but there are going to be major challenges and major changes to our sector in those years. They are yet to be fully identified, but one thing is clear, partnership between staff and students will be a core component to these future developments. Otherwise, we risk, the, we risk missing some great opportunities. So to close, I want to say thank you for your time this morning and to say that I have absolutely no doubt that we will continue to learn from each other today, tomorrow and into the future. The Union of Students in Ireland is, as always, committed to supporting and enhancing structures to support student engagement. And we look forward to working with you all into the future to achieve that. Garamila Magu. Garamila, good Lorna, thank you so much. So I'll pick it up here. Lorna, just huge congratulations and thanks to you for your leadership uh, we, and the student body. We, we hugely appreciate and need your leadership. So thank you. It's critical at this time that leadership is shown like you have done. And I was really struck by a few comments that you've made. Um, I think first of all, training. Um, I think there, there can be power plays often in rooms where students come in and it's not, you know, I'm thinking of governing authorities, I'm thinking of management teams where, you know, it can be a quite a lonely place for a student. Um, so I think we need to make sure the students feel supported and feel truly listened to, that it's not a sense of tokenism. And I think your idea there of meaningful engagement, I think is the phrase you used, uh, and the training I think are absolutely critical. And I think training is for as much for the staff as much for the students actually. Um, sometimes we kind of say, well, we got to train up the students and make sure that they can do all the things we want them to actually know. In some ways we need to get the staff and the management to listen too, um, and listen in a new and a different way. Um, I, I have the privilege of chairing the, the judging panel for the BT Young Scientists in Biology, and I was really struck by the piece of work that the two young men did this year in terms of, of gender matters. And what they showed actually was it was the boys that need the attention, not the girls. Actually, the girls were well able to recognise the importance of diversity and the role of that. And I suppose as much here for a student, um, it's much as the, the management and, and the organisations to learn and train us about how we can engage with students. So um, I hugely thank you, Lorna, for your leadership and, I, and, and for prompting us and continuing to challenge us. Um, I've just come off a meeting with my own management team this morning where people feeling uncomfortable and 
And I mean, I'm comfortable in the sense that change is happening. If if we're not feeling edgy and we're not feeling that things are changing and we're feeling uncomfortable, then change isn't happening in the way that we believe that should support our students. The final point, I think that we have a responsibility, all of us, there is a kind of a narrative creeping in that students are customers. Students are not customers, actually. They're not customers and we should not be thinking about students as customers. So we've got to be really careful that we don't create a narrative that brings us in a place that we don't want to be. And certainly as a higher education institution like UCC and a leader, I do not want that kind of narrative. I want a true partnership that you've called out, Lauren, and, and be assured that we will work really hard. We will make mistakes, but I want you to be assured that when you call it out, we will listen and we will try to do things better. And I hope that across the sector we will see that. So, Lauren, a huge thanks to you and the team at, SU, at the Stu Union of Students of Ireland, both locally for my own team, locally, and, and we've had our moments, as we all know, and that's good, actually, I've said that to them themselves. There, there will be moments we'll agree and disagree, but at, at least there's a mutual engagement, and that's the partnership. We're all on, on, the, on the same page. So, Lauren, a huge thanks to you for, for your fantastic uh, words of wisdom this morning and, and leadership. So I think we'll move on in the interest, uh, Kevin, if that's OK, I'll move on to the and, and Laura to the next two speakers. Um, so I, I'm heavily involved in in my own in my own discipline in climate change and climate action and sustainability. And I'm a scientist and I think and I, I don't mind saying this, I've said it out loud. I think scientists may have changed or failed actually in communicating the problems with climate action and climate change, probably because we speak too much to the head and maybe not to the heart. Um, and I think what we're seeing this morning is a really interesting presentation by Sophia Abbott and Lucy Mercier Mapstone, who are actually going to engage in a poetic dialogue. Um, I once had a, a conference on sustainability and our professor of creative practice came in and gave a dance to sustainability. Um, and, you know, people thought it was mad, but actually, you know, if you do get to people's heart and Irish people are really good at this. And I know they're we're, we're beyond Irish. There's lots of other different communities here. But in Ireland, we talk about music and poetry. And it's ironic that they are actually talking about poetry this morning. So I'm really excited to hear the next presentation by both Sophie and, and Lucy. So very briefly, Sophie is currently studying for PhD in education, concentrated in higher education, expected to conclude in 2024 in George Mason University, USA having completed her MA in higher education at uh, Elon University, uh, engaging in a project in student perceptions of teaching. She's currently studying, as I say, for PhD, and I think that will be really at the cutting edge of the knowledge generation. She's joined by Lucy, who's a lecturer curriculum in curriculum at the University of Sydney, previously lecturer in higher education and design in the Faculty of Science, University of Technology in Sydney, and her sole focus on academic development in STEM. And together they are building a partnership and actually they have produced a book um, called The Power of Student-Staff Partnerships, uh, Student, Faculty and, and Staff Revolutionising Higher Education. Let's have a revolution. So I'm really excited to hear uh, the presentation, which I think is a pre-recorded. So thank you so much. So I'll ask uh, someone to play the, the videos, please. Thank you so much. In short, we have many questions. What do we do when we use the same terms without realizing we're talking past each other? We re-examine. The single story of partnership could be a barrier to growth. What is partnership? Scholars use many names. Our space is probably most familiar to you as students as partners or student staff partnership. The language startles. It invites dialogue as metaphors do. It asks us to unlearn what we think we know. Machinations of higher education are always governed by politics. The isms are well documented and hard to ignore. Partnership is a political process. Questioning taken for granted ways, working against the grain. Here it's different. Partnership opens up new spaces. Spaces in the margin. Counter spaces that challenge. Collaborative equitable relationships in teaching and learning. Aspirational, values-based, highlighting the collocations. Academic selves. Student selves. Past selves. Future selves. We've all been students. Partnership provokes us, destabilizing neat categorizations that abstract us. Partnership makes us human again. The ambiguity of partnership opens our eyes, pushes us to accept discomfort, offers a new language, a new lens to explore, writes new rules for the classroom. 
exercise patience, be open-minded, fully understand, be playful in academic spaces, be joyful. You choose who you are going to be in partnership, a way of being in the academy. We are no longer acting. We must take seriously multiple sites of power. We navigate difficult terrain. This requires careful attention by all. I was not always met with understanding. I developed resilience through these resistances. This resilience allows me to push back. But how do we engage in partnerships meaningfully? We have to be ready for unexpected, sudden branching. Can students truly be equal when power, privilege, and status are inscribed? Are we unintentionally reinforcing exclusive beliefs? I wonder about the missionaries' civilizing tones of bringing resistance students into the fold. Does this sound familiar to you? Why do you think that is? We persist nevertheless. The urgency, weariness, a hope and hesitation. Some of us turned inside out. All of us disheveled and disoriented. This is a place in which we stretch ourselves in which we rely on one another to pull us in new directions, in which we are all equally twisted up. Aka, Mori, both to teach and to learn. This was our understanding of partnership. Students astonished that staff seek their perspectives, staff re-energized by the thoughtfulness of students. We became cohesive, transformed by authentic encounters. Partnerships allow us to aspire. We listen anew to each voice to know we would never know once and for all. So, Lucy, should we tell our audience a bit about what it was that we just read? Tempting to leave them in the dark, but um, yeah, let me give you a little background. So, Sophia and I recently published an edited collection of chapters from all around the world about student staff partnership. And this poem called Re-Envisioning Partnership is what's called um, a transcribed poem or a poetic transcription, where we've taken the words of all of our authors, over 50 of them, both students and staff, um, and put them into poetic form to bring new light into the way that we understand what this concept is that has been taking our sector by storm over the past kind of decade or so. And Sophia, we've been asked to talk today a little bit about provocative partnerships. And the first thing that comes to mind when we think about that phrase, um, for me, is always power. So if I ask you to unpack that poem a little bit, what does it tell us about the role that power plays in student staff partnerships in higher education? I think this poem really reinforces for me the way that power cycles in partnerships. Um, there's a, a cyclical way to the poem and to the process itself that um, we keep coming back to similar questions about um, agency and how we navigate our roles with one another. Um, and uh, the poem itself goes in these circles as well, focusing first on the hope and then on the challenge and then on the hope again and then on the challenge again, um, backwards and forwards in this kind of constant tension. Um, I like to think of power in partnerships in terms of feminist beliefs about power, that power never goes away. Um, when you're in partnership, you're never going to be in a situation where a student and a staff member is um, at the same level or, or has no power together. Um, and we wouldn't want that. But power can cycle and it can shift and move within the relationship. Um, and I think I've been really inspired by Bell Hook's idea of mutual empowerment, um, the feminist idea of power as empowerment, something that moves together through us and um, and isn't a zero-sum experience that together we can make each other even more powerful. Um, that's what the collaboration and, and kind of space and hope of partnership is for me. Lucy, I know that you examine power in your research through various theoretical lenses. Um, what do some of those lenses tell us about the complexity of these power relationships? Well, I think you can think of power in many different ways. The most obvious when it comes to student staff partnership is written in the name, right? Students have 
um, a very different type of power than staff do, and that power is inscribed by institutions. So, for example, staff have a lot, arguably a lot more power than students within the academy um, because we're paid to be here, our time is recognised and valued, um, we assess students, we set the curriculum. Um, historically, that has been our domain as staff. Um, but increasingly, we see students keep pushing back against that and exerting a power um, that they have predominantly in numbers. One of the ones that I really like to think about is the UK example of why is my curriculum white, um, where a large amount of students got together and started what has become an international movement to push the academy to be more diverse in um, how it represents diversity within the curriculum. And so I think power isn't as simple as inscribed by institutional roles, but then we also have to think of the intersections. And so a theory I really like to look at student self ownership theory is intersectionality um, by Kimberly Crenshaw, um, a feminist scholar from the US. And Kimberly Crenshaw talks about power existing as a matrix. And there's multiple different ways that people are imbued with power based on where we're positioned in society, our gender, our race, our um, neurotypicality, our ability, our sexual orientation. There's loads of different ways that we can have power or not have power and be oppressed by systems that um, underprivilege certain of those identities. And where those identities intersect, there's a really complex um, confounding factor that plays in. So um, I know there's some great work that has been done questioning um, power relationships in student staff partnership when race comes into play. So what if it's um, a woman of color is the staff member and the student in the partnership is a white male? Um, yes, the woman has more institutional power, but societally speaking has a lot less power because of her gender and her race. Um, so that for me is a really nice lens to kind of really complexify the, the notion of a partnership and power. Um, so I'd really like to share a poem with you. Um, this came from Anita Rakai and Rachel Gutman from, um, and myself working as students. And we did some reflection around our work as students and as women in student staff partnership. Um, and like the poem before, we transcribed our results um, in poetic form to bring new light to our voices in a way that collectively we could speak together. So this is the workshop of partnership. I am a strong, powerful woman, confident in my abilities and vital to my voice. I attended a workshop on partnership, a group of three, me, an undergraduate, a female faculty member, a male senior administrator. Interrupting a conversation I wasn't invited to, trying to insert my thoughts, a minimally disruptive decision. His back actively turned to me. I really had to shove them in. They nodded, officially expressed interest. A strong, powerful woman, a slight smirk. You know how they are. A token all that self-belief out the window. It felt like a defeat. I became a note taker. He thanked me for being part of the group. Wow. I think many people at this conference today will recognize themselves in the discomfort that is expressed in this poem. Um, can you tell me a little bit about where it came from, Lucy? Um, I think it was a sense of frustration that the three of us had about the discourse and narratives around partnership being about empowering students, but that if it's not done authentically and those bigger intersectional um, effects when they're not taken into account and really paid careful attention to in terms of the power dynamics, that partnership can actually be a really disempowering process. And so that was a combination of a number of our any experiences where 
we were tokenistically included as students in the room, but our voices were not valued and were not heard. And in nearly every instance where we felt that to be the case, there was usually a gendered um, impact intersecting there. And so trying to tease out that intersection that happens when we don't pay enough attention to power in its many forms in partnership. And Sophia, I know you have had a lot of experiences of working in partnership, um, like me, with between being students in partnership, being staff in partnership, being student and staff working in partnership at the same time. Um, what are some of the other ways in which power has played out in partnership for you? It's a great question. It's, I think the this poem and the one before and and what you were sharing earlier, Lucy, about intersectionality is um, the the role of your position in an institution is nebulous and um, an interesting part of working in partnership, um, especially as a student, and then moving on and continuing to be involved in this realm is that you don't stay a student, um, and that many people who get excited about partnership um, go through transitions and are sometimes students and then sometimes staff and then sometimes academics and they kind of transition through many of these roles and, and are multiple of these things at the same time. Um, and now as a graduate student, I'm experiencing that very firsthand. And that liminality is an element of partnership that is really key and um, interesting to dissect. Uh, there's a great article by Alison Cook Sather and um, Zane Smith um, talking about the finality of partnership and the way that partnership itself creates a liminal space for people to exist in, where um, your roles still matter, but you're also taking on or, or operating in a wholly new role, which is that of a partner. Um, and that itself is, I, I think, a both a challenge for power and for the traditional dynamics that we're working in, the social um, structures that never go away, but also a, a really cool space of hope and excitement. Um, I think another really exciting area, um, you mentioned tokenization in this poem, and um, I think the idea of being a token as a partner is a um, really interesting one to me and one that I think Hannah Goddard and Abby Flynn explore in really, really exciting ways um, in our book when they talk about student representation systems um, in the UK and the ways that student reps can be partners um, and can act in partnership ways, um, but are also asked to serve as representatives for the other students. Um, and in that sense, often at risk of being tokenized as the like epitomization of a student. And that's just not the case. Like a single student can never be a representative of every, every institution. So the power that that student holds is is quite substantial. But um, then the positions that they're put into speak for or speak on behalf of their peers and colleagues um, is a really challenging one, um, and can also put them in vulnerable situations um, with the, the institutional leaders that they're working with. And equally comes from a place of institutions wanting to give students power, right? Right. And so it ties back into that um, psych like cyclical nature of partnership. And I often raise questions about the notion of institutions giving students power, because if we think about Freire's work on pedagogy of the oppressed, um, which I know that some people have started drawing lines between partnership and kind of work, and I think that is absolutely fantastic. But um, he says that liberation has to come from the, the people who are being oppressed. It can't be something that is given because if it's given, it can be taken away. And I definitely think that notion is really um, an important one with about viewing representation systems through the lens of partnership. Mm -hmm. um, especially in the UK, where they're so wide and so um, well embedded, um, to acknowledge that they have great power for causing discount and tokenism, but also huge power and immense power 
for um, students to self-empower. And that's, that's the kind of language that I like to think of when it comes to partnership, um, is finding a place for students and staff to um, find mutual empowerment. Yeah. Yeah, um, I agree. And I think we've got one last poem for people if we're yeah, right. So um, I wanted to end with a poem of hope and of that space of mutual empowerment and what is possible in these close, reciprocal, trust-filled, really beautiful, joyful relationships. Um, this poem is by Abby Flint, um, and she published it in the Power of Partnership book um, in her chapter, um, and it's called Between Us. Her email suggests we meet in the not quite space of the university cafeteria to talk over coffee and cake. Here, supervisions and group work rub tables with dissections of nights out. She stands and waves. I know her by the scarf she often wears in class, blue and green geometric silk. We sit down to our uncertain task, a dance of asking, listening, carefully offering slivers of self between us, a brave space. She pulls the scarf through her fingers. Our work is built on work and small actions. A name remembered, a door held open, a poem outstretched, food shaped, tiny significant kindnesses. She lays her scarf across the table between us, an intricate path. I literally have goosebumps. I get it every time I read this poem because it just reminds me so much of all of the joys of partnership. Mm -hmm. So I think on that note, we're going to wrap up and um, hope that, as the title suggests, we've given you some provocations around partnership and um, it's been a real pleasure. So thanks for having us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That was really inspiring and amazing pedagogy. So thanks for organizing that. While we get back on screen, I think it's a bit fuzzy at my end. I think, okay, we're back. Um, just to remind us, hashtag student engagement 2020. The Twitter machine is pounding out the tweets, so keep them coming. So hashtag student engagement 2020. So I'm going to hand back now to Kevin to introduce our next speaker, Kevin, and we take some questions and answers then. Kevin, over to you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, John. Um, I think we may have a video now on equity and inclusivity. Thank you. We'll Thanks, Kevin. That yeah. video up. Just while we're waiting for that video to load, just a reminder to use the Q&A box if you want to submit any questions for any of this morning's speakers. We'll be doing a Q&A after our second keynote. Um, and I'll now pass on to the video. Thanks, Kevin. Kevin, I think we've gone into the Hudson. If anybody's watched that great movie with Tom Hanks and and and, and the, the pilots have put it into the into the river, so uh, we may have gone into the Hudson that we're coming back out of it. Um, but look, it's really hard. I can see Laura really working hard. So Laura, thank you so much. It's not easy, and we've all been there. So thank you. Don't worry. We we'll, we we'll, we we'll work through this. Work through this. I'm pretty I'm Thanks. Thanks very much, Thanks Laurie. Much Laurie. Much
Empathy and inclusion is critical for student engagement. As a student that could barely dad, I feel excluded in college when there's no caption on videos or on online lectures. Lectures have been reluctant to adapt their teaching methods to be more accessible to me. I'm not the only person that feels excluded, and other students with diverse backgrounds feel this way when they are not included in the conversation. The universal design for learning framework is important as it gives all individuals equal opportunities to learn by introducing more flexible methods of teaching, assessment, and service provision to cater for the diversity of learners in our classrooms. Our experts are experienced. We need to be included in these conversations, and with the co-production between staff and students, we can create a learning environment that is suitable for all students. Thanks, Laura, very much for managing that. That wasn't easy. Um, thank you. Thank you, um, Laura, and thank you, John. Um, we had a little bit of turbulence there, but we're back in smooth sailing again. Um, so some real food for thought from the contributions we've had so far this morning, uh, particularly, I think, in relation to the concept of power as it relates to engagement and partnership. And I'm sure there's lots still to come. So our second keynote speaker of this morning session is Dr. Catherine Bobble. Cathy is Senior Lecturer in Student Engagement at the Institute for Academic Development in the University of Edinburgh, and she's also a visiting fellow for Knowledge Exchange at the University of Winchester, where she teaches on, on the UK and I think possibly the world worldwide, the first Masters in Student Engagement, um, or one of her students is actually yours truly. Um, Cathy leads the IDT, IED Programme and Course Design Team, supporting curriculum enhancement across the University of Edinburgh. She leads the University Learning and Teaching Conference Team, is the convener of the Principal's Teaching Award Scheme, and supports a range of strategic student engagement projects across Edinburgh. Cathy is also a Principal Fellow of the Higher Education Academy, a Fellow of the Staff and Educational Development Association, and Scottish Representative on the UK Teaching Excellence Awards Advisory Panel. And she also regularly publishes and presents her research internationally on student engagement, students as partners, and student staff co-creation of the curriculum. In this presentation, Cathy is going to outline evidence of the benefits of building positive student staff relationships and partnerships. And she will use this evidence to explore whether we could be considered to be negligent if only some students get the experience partnership within higher education. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Cathy. Thank you ever so much, Kevin. I'm going to now try and do my technicalities of sharing my screen, um, which I'm hoping is working for you. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Um, and first of all, thank you ever so much to um, the National Student Engagement Programme, to uh, studentsurvey.ie and to QQI um, for this fantastic uh, opportunity to speak with you this morning. Um, the one downside of speaking this morning is that I have to follow um, Sophia and Lucy's wonderful presentation and also from uh, you know student uh, comments and uh, presentations previously. So um, that's the challenge, but um, I will I will do my best. Best. So, as Kevin has said, my kind of intention this morning is to try to ask a provocative question of whether we might be considered negligent if some students don't get to experience partnership. So if I can start by suggesting that I think most of us would understand partnership in different ways and we might define it in different ways and certainly Sophia and Lucy suggested that we often use different terminology and when we think of partnership we perhaps think of different things. So in some work that I did uh, about a year ago, um, I actually tried to create a, what I've called a typology um, in order to think about what kinds of partnership and co-creation we're doing. I use the term co-creation quite a lot and I'll come on to that shortly as to why. Um, and so just to give you a few examples within that typology, these are the kinds of questions I'm asking. What is the context for co-creation? So is it something that's seen as curricular? Is it extracurricular? Is it university wide? Um, have you selected students from a larger group? So students that are involved in that partnership 
Are they selected and perhaps um, interviewed for for their role? Are they uh, or are they being invited as a whole group or a class of students to be involved? And what's the nature of that involvement? Are students being informed, consulted, involved? Are they partners or are they leading the work? Um, and what is the nature of any reward or recompense that students might receive? Do they get paid? Do they receive some vouchers or perhaps some course credit? Perhaps they're not paid or in some cases students receive refreshments. And each of those different kinds of reward or recompense have implications for students in terms of their ability to participate. And there are all sorts of questions we might ask about inclusivity, depending on whether students are being paid or not and the nature of of their involvement. So there are lots of other questions within that typology that I've um, that I've produced, but in a sense it's there so that we can really see some of the patterns of different kinds of partnership. So you can imagine if we had a university wide par um, pr partnership initiative that involved a selected group of students and those students are perhaps working as partners and they're perhaps being paid for that piece of work. That is going to be quite different from a curricular um, partnership involving a whole class of students who perhaps are involved, but not always perhaps a, a, a level we would describe as partnership, and they're receiving course credit for that rather than being paid. You can see immediately that's just two examples, but that you can end up with quite a range of different kinds of partnership out there. So I think we do need to be careful when we're talking about partnership. What what sorts of partnership are we talking about? In this quote from uh, a book that I was involved in writing a few years ago now with some American colleagues, um, we came up with this definition of partnership um, specifically within learning and teaching. And this has been a, a, a quotation that I think has been referred to quite a lot within other people's writing and within the literature. I think one of the things I want to draw attention to here is that we highlight that often within partnership, this is about partners contributing equally, but importantly in this, not necessarily in the same ways. And so it's, I think partnership within this definition, that one of the key parts of that is about, you know, we can collaborate, but unless we're kind of contributing in equal ways and we have some sort of equal respect underpinning that, um, we have to sort of question, is that really partnership? And so that's led me very much to try to kind of distinguish between some different terminology. And so these are terms, and I'm looking at this very much within um, learning and teaching at this stage, hence why I've included the term active learning. But just to try and distinguish three kind of terms that you might see very regularly, but what is the difference between them? Because there's clearly overlap between these terms. And so if we look at something like active learning, um, that's involving students very much and meaningfully within teaching and learning. And so there's an implication of interaction going on between, a, between students and staff and between students and students. But it probably doesn't imply the level of equality that we're talking about when we say partnership. And so there is a there is a distinct difference between those and yet partnership also involves and requires interaction to take place and then if we go in the middle somewhere there co-creation a term i quite like using a lot i think as well as there being interaction the difference between active learning and co-creation might be around the expectation in co-creation for there to be shared decision making and there to be negotiation of decisions that are taking place um, and so that's in addition to that interaction that might be taking place in active learning. So I'm not convinced that active learning always includes shared decision making and negotiation, for example. And similarly, you would say for partnership that also involves shared decision making and negotiation, but I'm not sure that co-creation necessarily involves the equality that's implied. And the, my point for distinguishing those is that often I speak to staff and students around universities around the world and people say, you know, I'm doing this piece of work, but I'm not convinced that it can be called partnership. And I think really to free people up a little bit to say it may not be partnership, but what you're doing is incredibly meaningful and you are building these incredible relationships between staff and students and there is um, a real shift of power. Um, and there is shared decision making going on. So 
rather than getting caught up on, you know, can I call it partnership because actually I assess the students at the end of the course, or can I call it partnership because um, I'm a staff member and I'm being paid to sit on this committee, but perhaps the student rep is not being paid. Um, then I think in some ways that's where co-creation can be a helpful term to sort of free us up of some of that. However, so I will I will sort of move between those terms a little bit this morning. So a little bit of a shift into the start of me, why I'm asking this question about whether we can be considered negligent. Um, so back in 2014, there was a very interesting article that was uh, published by Freeman et al. And it's um, based in um, science, engineering, um, technology and maths, sorry, STEM kind of subjects. And they did a big literature review where they looked at all the evidence for active learning and the positive impacts that come from active learning. And they very uh, creatively, in my view, they um, asked a provocative question of it's trying to say if active learning evidence was seen as if active learning was seen like a medical treatment, then we would like basically with the evidence that exists to date, we would stop any control in a trial because we know that the treatment is effective. And so in a sense, we would be seen as ethically questionable if we continue to not offer that treatment to somebody. And so if we think about that in terms of active learning, they're suggesting it's ethically questionable to continue lecturing without actually having active learning as part of it. And so that got me to thinking about partnership in a little bit more detail. So let's think about the evidence that exists for partnership and whether we might be also potentially considered to be negligent. So some of the partnership evidence that's sort of growing um, that's out there is there's certainly evidence uh, suggesting that partnership leads to um, enhanced engagement, enhanced motivation, and these are benefits I should state that uh, from this work from Cook Sather, uh, myself and uh, Felton in the States, that we found these outcomes for both staff and students. Um, which I always think is, is very interesting and perhaps goes against what people think. They think, you know, these are the, uh, the benefits for students, but actually we were seeing these as shared across staff and students. Um, so engaged motivation and, uh, sorry, enhanced engagement and motivation, but also excitingly, I think, uh, real enhancement of metacognition. So students really report that they gain insights into how they learn and, ha and learning how to learn in more um, effective ways. Um, they gain a greater confidence and sense of identity through partnership practices and we see enhanced classroom practices and you can see for staff that kind of enhanced metacognition often comes through working with students in partnership tends to lead you to question why you teach in the way that you teach. Um, alongside that evidence, growing evidence also came at a similar time actually in terms of publication, but um, the Healy, Flint and Harrington work that was done for the Higher Education Academy, um, which was an overview of partnership, also drew together further evidence. And, a, and there was an international literature review in 2017, which actually uh, Lucy and Sophia, who have just presented, were both authors on that literature review, drawing together kind of growing evidence of the impacts of partnership. And we've seen also a burgeoning of new um, journals where there's a just growing evidence in a whole range of different kinds of evidence for um, benefits of partnership. And here's a different form of evidence. Um, so a quote from a student here, and this is actually now from about 10 years ago, um, some early partnership work. But to this day, Stephen is the only teacher who has asked me what I wanted to get out of taking class ever. I had never even thought about it. I grew up thinking what I assumed every other student thought and the majority of students still think. What do I want to get out of class? An A. The thought of actively trying to learn something never crossed my mind. I find that powerful every time I read it in terms of the importance of us actually connecting with students enough to have conversations and actually in this case work in partnership but to start to really um, engage and motivate students to want to get something from their learning. 
Another quote, not quite so positive, that I'm putting up here. This is a quote from uh, the UK National S Student Survey. Um, and I suspect it's not the only quote like that that we see in, in sort of qualitative comments. But I saw this comment and I just, uh, it, it really kind of moved me in a way to feel on what level is that acceptable? Is it ever acceptable for a staff member to be rude to a student? Um, and what this made me realise is we have a lot of work to do. So I think there's a step back almost from partnership to say, are we doing the basics of actually being respectful to one another? Are we doing the basics of building good relationships with one another? And so this I found this really provocative to think we've got those lovely quotes, you know, the lovely quote from the student just in the previous slide, suggesting that there's some amazing outcomes from partnership and yet other students, this is what they're experiencing. And I think, you know, we have we have work to do here. Uh, we also know from uh, from uh, work in the States, uh, George Koo, the sort of author of the the National Survey of Student Engagement in the States um, argues that the more contact there is between students and faculty, both inside and outside the classroom, the greater student development and satisfaction. And so I think the reason I've included this is because it's this reminder that it, this is not just about what happens within a classroom. This is not just what happens outside the classroom. This is about what happens across a university inside classrooms, outside classrooms. This involves every staff member in terms of how we create a sense of hospitality with students and it includes every student. So this is about sort of all being involved. So let's think about these relationships that we need to build in order to not have comments like, you know, staff were rude to me. Um, and there's a huge amount of evidence about the benefits of positive staff student relationships. Um, so lots of evidence suggesting that where there are positive relationships, students experience far more academic success. They have higher aspirations within um, for their education. Um, they have greater personal and intellectual development greater satisfaction and they have enhanced motivation and it may not surprise you that connected to that staff characteristics attitude and personality are also really important so staff who are warm and informal friendly and flexible accessible approachable and available empathetic genuine respectful understanding and honest tend to build better relationships with students and that might not sound surprising and that's a bit of a wish list, if you like, you know, if only we could have staff who have all of these characteristics. But it does beg the question, how do we try and create a culture in which we are encouraging staff to adopt certain attitudes and to try and develop certain characteristics in order to create the relationships that are needed for students to um, feel that they belong at university? but also um, to enable us to build the foundations for partnership. So in some work that I've uh, done recently in, the, in a, a recent book that I've published, I've actually um, highlighted one key thing here is within classrooms, particularly the first five minutes is absolutely key. Um, a staff member, a teacher will communicate to students very, very quickly what kind of relationship they're prepared to build with the students in the room and whether that's through the tone they take, whether that's through whether they encourage questions, if they ask questions, how they respond to those questions, are they welcoming of the kinds of things students are sharing? Do they encourage students to share anything about themselves and is the staff member in uh, alongside that willing to share some of themselves um, and so in those first five minutes students are very astute they will they're smart they will pick up very quickly the kind of attitude and approach that a teacher wants to take and so if we think about that every time a teacher meets a new group of students that is potentially an opportunity, an opportunity to create relationships and form the foundations potentially of partnership. So this is about building trust, respect, community, belonging, and ultimately, I think, showing that we care about students. And that um, way of thinking about teaching, I think, can also be broadened out to say, let's think about this in the whole of the university. How do we communicate in the first five minutes we meet 
a student? How do we communicate in the first five minutes? If you're a student that you meet a teacher or another member of staff in the university, how do we communicate within that early encounter that we care, we respect the people around us? Really, really important. One other th thing that seems to be really important to students is learning names. There's some absolutely fantastic evidence that's come from Arizona State University in this paper by Cooper et al, um, where they had a large class of 500 students in a biology class and they got them to create what they call name tents. So basically a piece of A4 paper folded in half lengthways they ask students to put the name, their name on the front of it. And it means that then when, a when the teacher wants to ask a question and in that class, they can use the student's name in terms of asking that question. Um, it's a small thing and it's really hard to learn the names if you have 500 students, um, but it seems to make a big difference. And they've got evidence from since using the name tense that students are basically finding teachers more approachable, they're more likely to come and ask them questions and the outcomes for the students are also more positive. Um, what I think is the gold dust of this particular study though is students are told, I, I didn't need to tell you, but we know they're smart and um, they know that a teacher cannot learn 500 names. But what seems to be statistically significant in this study is not whether the teacher actually remembers the students' names or not. Students say that what was important to them was that the teacher was trying to learn their names and making an effort to call them by their name. So really fascinating evidence that's coming that I think is really important if we're thinking about the importance of building relationships. So I want us to kind of just as I come to an end here, think about the importance of this being something we think about across a university and changing university culture. So I wanted to tell you two little vignettes, one about somebody who's called Miss Rita here. So this is about a woman called Rita Rillman. She works at uh, Wofford College in South Carolina, and she is the only member of staff at that college to have been awarded an honorary degree from the university. Um, She's known as Miss Rita by the students and the staff. She's seen as a bit of a legend uh, in the university. She's a member of canteen staff and she remembers all the students' names and she remembers all the things that they tell her about themselves. So when they go to the canteen and they go and get their baked potato, um, she remembers and she says, you know, hello, whoever, you know, she'll remember the name and then she'll say, how's your brother? You know, because maybe the last time you were in, you mentioned that you were worried about your brother and you were going to go and visit him um, because he hadn't been well. And she remembers those little things. I mean, to me, that's a superpower. I would really struggle to, to be able to do that, but she has that ability. And I love that the university has recognised that um, with an honorary degree, because we all need a few more Miss Ritas on campus. We need people who are um, making that effort. What, what effort does it take for us to say hello when we pass people in the corridor? Um, so I think, you know, that kind of uh, positive reinforcement that you belong, I think is, is really important. Another little initiative just to tell you about is um, at the University of Edinburgh, I um, implemented a coffee and cake conversations initiative. This was basically pairing up one student and one staff member from a uh, school or a department and then asking the student to invite two further friends, two students to join so that a group of four people were going to go out for coffee and cake. We gave them a voucher, um, said go and have coffee and cake. Here's a few sort of instructions if you know if you want to break the ice um, and it had a few questions like you know why did you choose to study this subject area? Why are you teaching in this subject area? Um, tell each other something about yourselves perhaps that people don't know but that you'd be willing to share um, and then literally instructions that say answer as many or as few of these questions as you want. Essentially just go and have coffee and have a chat. And um, it doesn't sound like rocket science, but the feedback we got from people was quite overwhelming. So we started getting emails from staff members who said, I did this and it reminded me why I came to teach in higher education. These students were so smart, they were funny. We had such good conversations. Um, we had students who said, I loved hearing about what it's like to see the department from a from a staff point of view. I loved seeing my lecturer as a human being. 
Um, we had comments from one group who said we don't need any more money, but we're going back out next week because we want to carry on the conversations. These were the sorts of things that we heard. And I think, you know, Lucy and uh, Sophia mentioned uh, they, there was a statement I wrote down when I was listening to them about partnership makes us human again. And there was a bit of me that says in this case, relationships really make us human again. And I think um, we I think this is what people were recognising in the feedback we were given was just chance and space to go and try and connect on a more human level. So I come to my provocation essentially to say if we think back to the active learning article that I mentioned, you know, with all that evidence that suggests, you know, if we carry on lecturing without active learning, then we're probably being ethically questionable or and I'm using the word negligent. Um, and so with all the partnership evidence that's growing and the and the evidence that re relationships are important and they are a kind of building block for partnerships. Um, if we're not offering opportunities for relational teaching and for partnership, then maybe I would argue, are we being negligent? And so I leave you with that as my provocation, essentially. Um, I've got a few more slides which basically just have a little plug for my book in case you're interested and photo credits and some references, but I think colleagues will probably um, share these um, with you afterwards. So I'm going to just finish there with the provocation, I think. And I'm hoping I've stopped. Sorry, I've probably shared strange things on screen. Thank you, Cathy. That was really inspirational and I, there was a lot for going on in that for me, I have to say, just to bring me into a space for, as a learner. Um, and I'm just wondering, and we might come back to this later. I know Kevin and I were looking at questions. We, I think we'll extend this session to 12.30 if that's OK, because I know that's pushing out the, the timing a bit, but I think it'll be really nice to hear some questions. And uh, uh, Kevin, I'll go to you, but just to remind again, uh, hashtag, um, I'll probably get it wrong again here now, Student Engagement 2020. Cathy, there's one thing that struck me, and if I may just start myself, if it's OK, um, is, as I say, there's a lot going on there. and. I'm just wondering, because words are important actually, um, and you know, if we are truly committed to lifelong learning, all of us, then all of us are learners actually. Um, so faculty and student are learners. So the extent of which we might change the narrative by, you know, because if you really want co-construction in curriculum, co-construction assessment, and I know you, uh, you and I in our roles today maybe have to do the assessment at the end, but actually peer assessment is also emerging. So you know that kind of is that's going on in my head as you're speaking and you 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 inspired me Cathy so what's your kind of reaction to that kind of uh, discourse in my head if it's any help to any colleague thank you it's a great question i think uh i'm paulo freire has already been uh, mentioned this morning but there's a fantastic quote from paulo freire about when we get to a point where we're enlightened in the way that we educate we actually move to a point where students become teachers and teachers become students and it's almost that um, there's a, he's far more eloquent in his quotation but it's almost a kind of a, a learner as teacher and a teacher as learner and these mm. as long as we acknowledge that actually we can step into both of those roles I think um, and I, I, there's a lot to be said where a teacher will open up and say actually I'm learning too and that signals a huge amount to students in terms of saying, you know, this is not someone who um, doesn't get things wrong and is perfect. Um, this is someone also on the learning journey. And actually the joy is if you can learn with a group of students. I think that's great. Um, I also wanted to reference there's an interesting project that's run by Edinburgh Napier University, um, which is a, a kind of peer observation of teaching project where students are the observers. There's a number of these projects and Sophia led one of these projects at Trinity University in Texas. Um, but what I liked about this project at Edinburgh Napier is they've actually called it students as colleagues. And I mm. think the, they had some really interesting debates about the use of that term and some uh, faculty not being particularly happy about the use of that term and others saying this is great because it recognises 
the way that we should be relating to students. So that, those are my sort Thanks, of Kathy. Yeah. And I just wish I could talk more, but I better stop because I think, you know, if we are in a university where knowledge is co-created and generated through the curriculum, then it, the magic happens for me when you have that special moment. But I'll stop. So I let Kevin maybe, there's a number of questions coming in which we're publishing as well, so we might keep an eye. Kevin, do you want to take the cockpit yeah. over for a moment? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll take over. Uh, thank you very much, John. Um, so I might go to Sophia for the next question. Um, and I'm going to put a question from Maurice Birmingham from CIT. Um, so Maurice has asked that good relationships and being valued are human wants. And she's asking, do you think that teaching and learning culture needs to move from transmission to dialogic? Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think that's um, absolutely the direction that higher education is starting to move. I see many hopeful spaces of that. Um, and I think all of the initiatives that Kathy was mentioning earlier and that Lucy and I mentioned in our talk are examples of this, but I, I do completely agree. I think critical pedagogy and the work of folks like Paula Freer and, um, and Bell Hooks and others are really I, I, more important than ever now. Um, the differences that exist between staff and students um, in many cases are so huge that you need to come together in these dialogic spaces, not only to have really rich and um, interesting learning and um, sort of mutual empowerment possibilities, but also just to understand one another as, as humans. Um, uh, actually, Leo Lambert and um, Peter Felton have just recently published a book called um, is it Relationships? in higher education, yeah, relationship rich education. And Kathy has it there on her desk right now and it's um, an excellent book, um, but it talks a lot about the power of those, those moments of kind of dialogic coming together, not only in the classroom, but beyond the classroom in higher education and how powerful that is for um, student belonging and success and um, everyone's learning and, and just institutional growth. Um, I think that's a, an element that we don't talk as much about, but um, that to advance institutions themselves, to have students in dialogue with staff um, and and others, community partners and others in the um, kind of local area, that that's really important. Thank you very much, Sophia. Um, I might take another question now that's for Kathy. Um, so this question came in from Sean O'Reilly from Thea Technological Higher Education Association, and his question is Kathy, do you have any insights to share about development student engagement and partnership in a collaborative manner? And he said, arguably, the manner that would perhaps take place in places like Scotland and Ireland against approaches that are perceived as top down or systemic encouragement, um, which may take place in other places, other UK jurisdictions, perhaps. Um, and maybe your thoughts on the advantages and disadvantages of the different approaches to, to engagement and partnership. Great question. Uh, yeah, we're we're often seen as the envy of the rest of the world. I think Ireland and Scotland in uh, some of the the ways that we've approached things like student engagement and the organisations that we have. Um, so that's it's it's enviable to one degree because we have these great organisations that, for example, underpin training for student representatives. Um, that uh, fund a whole range of work around student engagement. But what we have to be very careful of is that that doesn't become seen as so now lots of people can can kind of see that as somebody else's responsibility. Um, and so it doesn't need me, you know, an average person within a, I don't know if I'm an average person within a university, but it, you know, it doesn't need me to therefore put attention or effort into um, doing work on student engagement. I don't know if I'm making sense there, but I think, um, yeah, that's the only danger when we have fantastic organisations who are really supporting great a great deal of good work um, that people don't um, rem demit that responsibility, if you like. Um, having said that, it's just amazing to have those uh, support mechanisms running throughout the ways that higher ed and further ed um, work and um, so yeah in a sense we've got work to do perhaps within our own countries but also um, you know we can share that work perhaps more widely than we we already do 
um, with other parts of the world. But equally, I think we need to stay open to learning from others, because even if others don't have those same mechanisms, there are also amazing pockets of practice going on in different parts of the world that we can learn from. Hence why it's so wonderful to see kind of uh, people from different countries presenting here already today. Thanks very much, Cathy. Um, I'll pass back to John now to ask maybe one last question before we move to the section. Thank you very much, Kevin. And I think just to remind colleagues, the chat has also got a range of resources which people are posting up in terms of uh, websites and, and links, which is incredibly, incredibly valuable. Um, Kevin, you caught me now. I'm struggling to find a question. Um, OK. Uh, OK, let me go back up. Uh, so Marie says, so is building relationships and trust key element to these conversation? What is it we are trying to do here can happen? So about trust, a key element. I would say trust and respect, but um, we'll see what you think. Uh, maybe Sophia and maybe then Cathy, if that's Sophia, I might go to you first and then Cathy, I might go to you. Definitely. Yeah, I think building trust is is a really important element of this process. Um, I saw a conversation actually just yesterday on, I guess it was on LinkedIn, um, about whether you need to have trust to do deep listening um, or whether deep listening can be a pr can help you to build trust. And I do think that actually having processes of deep listening can can help you to build trust. So there are tools that we have that can help us get to that point if it's not already existing. And I do think there are many situations where there is lack of trust between students and staff um, and that it's really difficult to overcome that hurdle. But um, there are also tools at our disposal to do so that we don't we don't have to be lost in those spaces and we don't have to think, OK, if trust doesn't exist, if there's been a breach of trust or um, a crisis of some kind, um, if COVID even has made things really tense and difficult between us, um, that that doesn't mean that partnership is then off the table for our future process. Um, and I think Kathy probably has even more to say about this, so I'll, I'll let her take over. Thank you, Sophie. Take over. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I feel that um, trust is the absolute basis um, for building relationships. So I'm back at relationships again to sort of say if we're going to get to the point of partnership, we need the building blocks in place to some extent. It's a bit of a, a circular argument. I think we need trust in order to build relationships. We build relationships by building trust um, and then by having built a good foundation, it makes it easier for us to set out in partnership but the partnership processes that we experience actually help to build further trust and help to build further relationships so this is it's all very interconnected and i'm not convinced that we can do any of these things without the other but i also fundamentally think that if we don't build trust and build those kind of basic relationships that actually it's very very hard for us to do many other things that we want to do in higher education Good teaching, for example, very, very hard without without that underpinning trust and, and good relationships. So, yeah, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Basically, trust, respect, shared responsibility. Yeah. Cathy, thank you so much. And Sophie, and I'm going to conclude the session uh, given where you are, Sophie, with a, a poem because you've introduced us, a verse of a poem. Uh, because you've introduced us to that great pedagogy this morning. We've heard a lot about this when you hear the last sentence. And it's of course by the great Seamus Heaney, 25 years in Ireland, having received his Nobel Prize for poetry. Uh, he says, history says don't hope on this side of the grave. But then once in a lifetime, the long for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. Um, we've heard Joe Biden say that last week. Those of us who are familiar with the great work of Seamus Heaney, I think. Um, so if you've done something special, Cathy, you've done something special this morning for us. We thank you for it. We thank you for opening the conversation. We thank you for all your contributions. Congratulations and well done. Thank you.